There are five things you don't want to do at a fundraising event. Some can be mildly harmful and others can be devastating. But there are ways to reverse course if you're headed down the wrong path. Watch and learn. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, I helped one of our local teams in Texas with their fundraising dinner. They started off doing their events so well, but as they started recruiting wealthy volunteers to help run the dinner, a few outspoken individuals convinced the leaders that they needed a big name speaker if they hoped to grow. The first few years, they got some well-known speakers, but no one overwhelming. But at the end of every dinner, the idea of a bigger name speaker was brought up. It started with Susan Baker, the wife of former Reagan Treasury Secretary James Baker. The next year, the former secretary himself was recruited to speak. Then a series of other well-known politicians that led to someone recruiting former Vice President Dan Quayle to speak. And he definitely drew a large crowd. But once you start down the rabbit hole of trying to top the prior year speaker, it never ends. So, when you just had the Vice President of the United States, who's left? You guessed it the President of the United States. By this time, it was 2002, and their Houston connections were able to secure President George W. Bush. It seemed like a major get. Registration soared, but this was an off-election year, and a few days before the dinner, the White House called and said President Bush had to be in a district where a congressman was in a tight race. The representative apologized for the inconvenience, but the president had to cancel. The board felt there was no way to find any replacement, and the dinner was canceled. With a tarnished reputation, that dinner never came back, and our efforts at that school shut down for more than a decade. There are five things not to do at your fundraising event. They are as follows. Don't number one, do not sell tickets or tables. There's a common misconception that the best way to do a fundraising dinner is by selling tickets or tables. After doing more than 2,500 dinners, I've proven that theory is just not correct. I find that people who buy tickets to events, see the price of that ticket as not only covering the cost of the meal, but also covering their donation. Thus, at the end of the night, they give little to nothing when asked for a donation. The average guest has no concept of what a meal costs when using a venue. They take what it costs for a dinner at a local restaurant and reduce that because, after all, it's a nonprofit event. So, if a meal at a restaurant costs 20 to $25, then the nonprofit must have gotten a bulk discount, which is probably closer to 10 to $15 per plate. When in reality, there are expenses that the average restaurant does not have additional servers, equipment, laundry, etc. In fact, the average meal cost is about $50 per plate plus gratuities and sometimes taxes. So if the average nonprofit charges a ticket price of $25 to $50, the reality is that they are starting with a deficit. In theory, that deficit is supposed to be made up with donations at the end of the night. However, as I've said earlier, donations are not that much after purchasing a ticket. Plus, by charging a fee, current donors or friends can come without a problem but few new or potential donors come because they don't want to spend the money. I always say it's so much easier to ask someone who doesn't know you to purchase a meal. 
There are nonprofit leaders who understand this concept, but unfortunately, default to selling tables. After all, isn't it better to get a large donor to purchase a table so their friends can come? Selling tables has all the opposite effects that you don't want. First, your larger donor purchases a table for $250 or $500, and they see that as their donation. So someone who may have had the, been capable of giving $5,000 gives $500 to fulfill their table obligation and nothing more. In addition, when a host purchases a table, they lose their incentive to fill the table with the most qualified guests. Thus, the table is filled with warm bodies, but few guests who become donors, and that defeats the purpose of the event. Don't number two, do not use a big name speaker. Whenever I'm asked to help start a dinner effort, one of the first things I hear from board members is, well, we need to find a big name speaker. Nothing could be further from the truth. Over the years, I've found that guests come to an event to hear a big name speaker and could care less about the organization. And if you're providing complimentary meals, this is the wrong thing that can be done because you're purchasing meals for a lot of people who never give a gift. You want people to come to your event because they want to hear and give to your organization. They resonate with your mission, vision, and values. I've always said I would rather have 250 guests who love you than 500 who could care less about you. Big name speakers come with a big price tag, some 25,000, 50,000 or more. That expense cuts in your bottom line into the profit of the event. And big name speakers also want to speak for 60 to 90 minutes or more. After all, they want you to get your money's worth. The most effective amount of time or the sweet spot for a main speaker is 20 minutes or less. That would not make a big name speaker with a high fee cost effective. And unfortunately, using big name speakers will get you into a terrible vicious cycle as I shared earlier where every year you have to top the last speaker. Don't number three. Do not use sponsors or underwriters. Many organizations include sponsors into their fundraising effort, and it seems so right. Find a bunch of corporate sponsors who will underwrite the cost of the event or who will sponsor aspects of the event, and everything after that is net income. Organizations use that as an incentive to get people to give more. All our expenses are underwritten, so 100% of your giving goes to the organization. It sounds so right. Unfortunately, it has the opposite effect. Guests think that you have deep pockets and decide not to give because their gift isn't needed or important. You lose the backbone or heart and soul of your event, the potential new donor who could give for many years to come. All underwriting and sponsorship does is make you feel good. All your costs are covered before the event, but it provides no incentive for guests to give more, especially give at a significant sacrificial level. I prefer asking those same underwriters or sponsors to participate in a matching gift effort where their gift is used to leverage other giving especially when a minimum amount to qualify for the match is used. Getting five business leaders or major donors to give $5,000 to fill a pool of $25,000 can be used to match any gifts given of $1,200 or more or $100 a month over a year will push people to higher levels of giving for the match. That is a much better way to get upfront commitments from others. Don't number four, do not have broad appeals. One of the things I like most about dinners is that giving is usually undesignated. Opportunities to give to programs and projects are presented, but no designation is recommended. However, too many nonprofits have taken that literally and they just ask for things like, help us keep the lights on, help us keep the doors open, 
Unfortunately, these are the exact opposite things that should be asked for. Whereas people don't need to designate their money, they do need to see a reason to give and they need to have an idea of where their money will go to what will be accomplished. Selling the sizzle, not the steak. A raw piece of meat doesn't excite anyone, but throw that meat on the grill and the juices hit those flames and the aroma waffles over the room and your mouth instantly starts to water. The same is true for nonprofit cause concepts. People need to know that their gift of 5,000 or 1,200 is going to go to things like this. If your mission is to bring clean water to impoverished villages and you bring water filters into those villages, it helps to know that a filter costs $45 but can give clean water to a village for three months. And your gift of 4,500 could provide 100 filters and reach 10 villages and 100 people in a village. The could in this example leaves the door open for the donation to go elsewhere should the need be greater. Make sure that your event lists very specific ways that a gift can make a difference in a specific number of lives should the decision be to use it that way. Don't number five, do not use auctions. One of the biggest mistakes made in fundraising events is incorporating auctions into a strategy. I've seen organizations do everything right with their dinner strategy but include an auction into the night and unknowingly lose large sums of money, actually lose gifts that could have gone to special projects or programs. Auctions have been proven to be a distraction when combined with most events. A certain segment of the audience buys a product and that's their donation to the organization. They enjoy the evening solely because they can purchase something of value at a reduced price. Thus, getting a discounted product because the sole reason they go to the event, not to hear about the mission, vision, and values of the organization. It draws the wrong kind of person to your event. Also, soliciting companies and ma and pa businesses to donate products takes work, a lot of work, and yields little return, oftentimes only a fraction of the donation. And the labor, oftentimes done by volunteers, underutilizes some of your best workers. I know that a qualified table host is going to see 1,000 to 5,000 on average come from giving at the table. The average auction gift will yield a donation of approximately $250. If a volunteer only had so much time in a day, what's the best use of their time? Getting more table hosts or donated products. Plus, the RAS makes organizations declare the value of the product and the tax deduction is the difference between the value of the gift purchased at the auction, where 100% of the money given after event appeal is tax deductible if taxes, if tables are not sold. There are many more things not to do at your event, but these are the top five. Doing these will torpedo and even kill your event. Not doing them can salvage your event or allow it to grow exponentially. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, let me know by giving it a thumbs up and leave a comment below if, you, if there were things you especially liked or if there are topics you'd like to address. And let this community of life javers know that you are part of making a difference in our world. If you wish to watch future videos on this channel, hit the subscribe button and click the bell to be um, notified immediately of the release of the next video. If you, you wish to follow me on Instagram, go to Jim W. Dempsey, or if you have questions, go to www.fundraisingmasterminds.net forward slash Jim and Java. If you wish to be part of a community of like-minded leaders, join our Life Changers group on Facebook. If you want to know what to do and what to say on an appointment with a major donor, 
watch this video and get and take your development efforts to the next level as always i wish you the best as you strive to become fully funded thanks a lot see you in the next video